you thank you. That was so nice. And sometimes it gets embarrassing when the applause are longer before the talk than after. The talk. <laughs> and contrary to the rumor that was going around, I had no intention of giving this talk wearing a toga. That was not a serious. So some of you came under a false impression. Tonight I want to go back 2,000 years to talk about social realities that remain relevant to us. Our images of the past are created largely by history's winners. The losers are muffled or muted, while their voices are very rarely heard. I think I agree with Catherine Moreland, who said, it's rather odd that history should be so dull, since so much of it must be invention. <laughs> the writing of history has long been a privileged calling it's undertaken in the church, the royal court, the affluent townhouse, the government agency, the university, the corporate funded foundation. The powers that be not only try to control events, they also try to control our understanding of these events, which is part of controlling the events themselves. Class struggle extends into the writing of history itself. Edward Gibbon, author of the monumental work, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. He talked about how history had to be written by gentlemen, because only gentlemen, gentlemen had the means to pursue such a calling. In his words, wretched will be the work of those whose daily scholarly efforts are stimulated by daily hunger. <laughs> Given himself produced what I would call gentlemen's history, a genre heavily imbued with an upper-class ideological perspective. From the very beginning, all through antiquity, we had gentlemen historians. Homer, Herodotus, Thucydides, Polybius, Cicero, Livy, Plutarch, Suetonius, Appian, Josephus, Tacitus. I'm naming the ones I've read. I've left out a few. But almost all of whom all of whom had a rather low opinion of the common people. Gibbon himself was a member of parliament, a firm supporter of British imperialism. He opposed extending rights to the American colonialists. He hated the egalitarian of the French Revolution. This Gibbon had no difficulty conjuring up a fairy tale pastoral image of the Roman Empire. In his words, where all the vanquished nations blended into one great people with no desire to regain their independence, enjoying the benefits of Rome's rule, directed by both absolute power, virtue, and wisdom. Yeah, right. <laughs> rarely, rarely do we hear about an empire built upon sacked towns, burned crops, shattered armies, enslaved prisoners, and mercilessly impoverished and overtaxed populations. One eminent 20th century British historian, Cyril Robinson, offers a familiar and fanciful notion of an empire that's achieved stochastically, that is by chance, without conscious design, without intent. <laughs> Quote, it was perhaps almost as true of Rome as of Great Britain that she acquired her world dominion in a fit of absence of mind. Yeah, right again. <laughs> Another fairy tale image. An imperialism without imperialists. Isn't that remarkable? Well, what do you have? A conspiracy theory? Do you think they consciously planned and calculated? and raised armies and decided there were profitable areas to conquer? You think they actually thought about it ahead of time? <laughs> it was all spontaneous, confused, innocent, absent-minded. This is not so funny. We hear the same thing today. The United States was thrusted into the world arena and had to reluctantly assume the role of world leader to meet the challenges of the 20th century. <laughs> We're never told who did the thrusting, for whose interests, and at what cost to people at home and abroad. 
nor why it still remains such a global imperative to have world leadership now, even without the bugaboo of world communist conspiracy to use as an excuse. Along with this class bias, the gentleman historian is likely to be a male supremacist. Was anybody surprised by that? <laughs> Gibbon, for instance, describes one emperor's wife as, quote, united to a lively imagination, a firmness of mind, and strength of judgment seldom bestowed on her sex. <laughs> I love Berkeley audience. <laughs> You know, some colleges, you, may, you read a quote like that, and you sit and you go, so what's wrong with that? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but, but let's not get discouraged. Okay. Usually left unnoticed was the plight of ordinary Roman women who tended to die younger than their male counterparts because of childbirth, exhaustion, malnutrition, and mistreatment. In recent decades, by the way, with the emergence of feminist scholarship on, on Jerome, the, the treatment of Roman women has improved. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 his, the scholarly, the scholarly treatment of... <laughs> the scholarly treatment of this subject has improved. God, I hate Berkeley audiences. <laughs> Some gentlemen historians let slip a noticeable ethnic bigotry or ethno-class bigotry. Cyril Robinson asserts that the, quote, purity of Roman blood began to be contaminated by proletarians of Greek and Oriental origin, persons of feeble and incapable character, feeble and incapable character, unable to assimilate the national habits of decency and restraint Although not all Greeks, of course, were vicious or unwholesome characters. <laughs> it's always a kind of bitterly amusing when bigots uh, try to smuggle in their bigotry under a kind of balanced statement, you know. <laughs> Some of my best friends are, are feeble and incapable characters. <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> the great Theodore Mumpson. Mumpson. Maybe you remember that. Mark Twain's description of Mumpson, the popular reception he got at a German university when Twain was visiting Germany, and from whom we might expect something better. Mumpson scornfully describes the Roman Forum. Now, the Roman Forum was that great open area where the assembly met, the popular assembly, the common people. Mumpson calls it a shouting fest for everyone in the shape of a man, Egyptians and Jews, street boys and slaves, Freedmen and Greeks. By the way, Mumpson was never all that liberal or all that left. But he became more liberal in his old age when he entered Parliament. Anyway, when push comes to shove, most left academics are more academic than left. <laughs> Another eminent classicist, Jerome Carcopino, writes that interbreeding between interbreeding between Roman aristocrats and their female slaves or freed women created a hybridization similar to that which has more recently contaminated other slave-owning peoples. Whoa. It strongly accentuated the national and social decomposition of Rome, unquote. I mean, no Nazi blood theorist could have said it better. I mean, these are reputable historians I'm quoting from today the progenitor of all gentlemen historians of the late Republic. And one of its major participants was Cicero, who has been worshipped by professors and Latin teachers throughout the ages. Cicero railed against the Greeks and Jews who rallied to the side of democratic leaders. Quote, impoverished individuals. See, that's a pejorative term. They're impoverished, so what could they be worth? Right there you see his class bigotry. Impoverished individuals, they often throw our assemblies into confusion. The Greeks are given to shameless lying, the Jews to barbaric superstition. 
You know how influential these Greeks and Jews can be in informal assemblies, unquote. That's the great Cicero. Tonight, I want to concentrate on that period of ancient Rome known as the Late Republic, specifically the period from 133 BC to 44 BC, the year that Caesar was assassinated. While a republic in form, how democratic was the Roman Republic in actual content? At the very bottom of the social order was a large slave population, about one third of the entire populace, many of whom were worked to death in the mines and on the plantations or latifundia, as the Roman called them. That's the Roman word, latifundia. On the next rung was a great mass of urbanized free Romans. They were known, the Latin word was proletariat. Many of them ex-slaves or the descendants of slaves who lived at the barest subsistence level. Many of them lived crowded in thousands of disease-ridden tenements within Rome itself, cheaply built structures that went up eight and nine stories high that frequently burned down or collapsed and killed their occupants. The rents charged for these fire traps were usually more than the poor could afford, forcing them to double and triple up under highly unsanitary conditions. No running water, no sewage disposal, inadequate ventilation, and lots of typhoid. A rung above the proletariats were the small farmers around the outskirts of the city and beyond, a substantial part of the Italian population, and above that, a very small middle class of minor officials, merchants, and light industry employers. Looming over this multitude was a few thousand multi-millionaires, the class known as equestrians. They were sort of a lesser nobility. They were called equestrians, or equites in Latin, because um, they were rich enough to be in the cavalry, which was the elite thing they could afford the cavalry, although by the late Republic, most of them had never even been on a horse. Uh, the equestrians, most of them were state contractors, bankers, traders, tax collectors, and landowners. Now, at the very apex of this social pyramid were the wealthy landed aristocrats who populated the Roman Senate, who also invested in business and banking, along with their vast holdings. The Senate aristocrats were absentee owners of vast latifundia. They did very little for the land except populate it with slave labor and squeeze it for all the profits they could get out of it. Cicero, who was an equestrian and a member of the Senate, owned more than eight villas. He had many speculative investments, and he had numerous inner city tenements. And it's very interesting that very few present-day historians of ancient Rome mention the fact that Cicero was a slumlord. He actually <laughs> bragged about how profitable his tenements were. They didn't think it was very important for us to know that about Cicero. <laughs> the wealthy grew still richer by the second century by usurping the Ager Publicus, or the Arger Publicus, our pronunciations of Latin, by the way, are, is heavily compromised by English. Uh, I could probably satisfy some Latin purists here if I talked about Cicero instead of Cicero and Julius Kaiser instead of Julius Caesar, but I think the rest of you would get irritated. <laughs> <laughs> the Ega Publicus was the public lands, fertile state-owned lands outside of Rome, beautiful lands, very fertile, that had been farmed for generations by small farming collectives, which paid a modest rent to the state and which produced enough food to feed the entire city. During times of war from the third century on down to the second, with farmers away in the army, the farms couldn't be kept up and the aristocrats started buying them up at bargain prices. Or the aristocrats increasingly used hired thugs to force the families off the public land replacing them with slave labor. I think a process that was completed probably early in the second century by 190, 180 BC. And eventually the aristocrats stopped paying rent. So there was a total privatization of the, the agar publicus became the agar privatus. That's a word I just made up. <clears throat> We're seeing that same thing happening all over the world. So greater accumulation for the few brought increasing economic misery to the many. 
This process of egalitarian displacement continues to this day in many parts of the world, including the United States itself. I was talking to members of the Farmers Union in Nebraska, and they will tell you stories about what family farms are facing and what a cost this is to our whole uh, agrarian culture. It reinforces, I think, the thesis I presented in Dirty Truths that great wealth creates great poverty. We often think of the disparities between wealth and poverty as just being a matter of maldistribution. And in fact, it is an interracial dynamic. You cannot have rich without poor. You cannot have masters, rich masters, without poor slaves creating that wealth. You cannot have lords without serfs. You cannot have rich plutocrats without hardworking, exploited workers and overtaxed taxpayers. Rome, as I said, was a republic more in form than content. But neither was the form all that democratic. Almost all major decisions were made by the Senate, an aristocratic, non-elective oligarchy. Numbering about 600 men of wealth, the Senate controlled foreign policy, the purse strings of the republic, the appointment of military commanders. Besides the Senate, there were two assemblies in which there were many more voting units allocated to the rich, which permitted the wealthy class to prevail on most issues. So even the assemblies were not really accessible to the common people or democratic. Those attending the assemblies could vote only on proposals submitted by one of the higher magistrates. And they could only vote yay or nay, and that was it. There was no right to amend any clause. It was called fast track. Mm. <laughs> With enough unity and mass mobilization, occasionally popular forces could carry something through the Senate, and I will discuss those instances, but that was the rare exception. Our friend Cyril Robinson finds nothing wrong with senatorial domination. He writes, those who bore the chief burden of fighting and financing the city's wars should also possess the chief voice in directing the city's course. First of all, he doesn't explain why financing wars should give you civic power civic monopoly power. In any case, the very rich did not bear the chief burden of fighting. That dangerous task fell mostly to the yeomen, the peasants, and later on, to a lesser degree, the proletariat. In fact, the rich senators carried very little of the financial burden. They paid no taxes. They lent money to the state that was paid back to them with interest, paid back from taxes that were levied upon the common people at home and in the provinces, the conquered provinces. So you had this combination of deficit spending and regressive taxes that amounted to an upward redistribution of income from poor taxpayers to rich creditors. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> to run for election, one had to be either wealthy or have the support of wealthy backers. The buying of votes was widespread. Rarely did candidates address important issues. To distinguish themselves from each other, they emphasized their personal qualities, their integrity and leadership, the prestige of their family name, their association with important personalities of the day, their record of public service and military service. Does any of that sound familiar? The only thing missing was television, I'd say. Within the Senate itself, control was concentrated in an inner circle of 20 or so of the most influential aristocratic families. By the second century, this elite group, the richest, the most prestigious, the most influential, had themselves divided into two factions. The larger one was called the optimates, literally the best men, as they modestly refer to themselves. <laughs> they were conservatives devoted to expanding the privileges and powers of the rich. The smaller faction of Senate elites were called populares. They were reformers with democratic tendencies who sometimes sided with the common people and with the sovereign right of the assembly to make decisions without prior consent from the Senate. Modern day historians are perfectly aware that the Senate enjoyed a near monopoly of undemocratic power. Yet they are filled with praise for these oligarchs, describing them, I'll give you a few quotes, as bred to a strong tradition of cautious sanity and self-restraint. Gentlemen of responsibility and leadership, stout-hearted, level-headed, and patriotic. 
Historians look kindly upon this republic for the few. For them, senatorial plutocracy is more acceptable and less threatening than proletarian egalitarianism. They embrace Cicero, a self-enriching slaveholder, slumlord, and ruling class mouthpiece. They embrace Cicero as a champion of Republican liberty, who opposed Julius Caesar and who refused to live under tyranny. And when I say they, I mean about 95% of present-day historians of Rome are Cicero admirers. Only a handful are sympathetic to the populares and Democrats. What does that say about our universities? Cicero, that great champion of Republican liberty, deplored such things as the secret ballot. He said, the secret ballot makes it easier for the common people to act independently and do mischief. <laughs> A year after Caesar was murdered in 44, Cicero, Cicero was not among the assassins, but he fully supported the deed. He wrote to Brutus and other associates, calling for a ruthless bloodletting, a final solution against the Democrats. I do not admit any doctrine of mercy. There should be a salutary severity, for if we are going to be merciful, civil wars will never cease. We need extreme measures." Unquote. One is reminded, by the way, of Cicero's own role as consul 20 years earlier in 63. Now remember, this is BC, we go backwards. 63 comes 20 years ahead of 44. Um, they were very confused in those days. <laughs> Cicero, Cicero in, in 63 launched a witch hunting campaign against reformers in the Senate and then ordered without trial the unlawful execution of five people he charged with conspiracy against the state. A, few, a couple of them were senators too, on the basis of very dubious and trumped up evidence. It's called the Catiline Conspiracy. Few modern day historians pass severe judgment on this political crime. H. H. Scullard, he sets the tone by allowing that, well, Cicero may have been, quote, over hasty, but he had good reason to feel he had done his duty. Indeed, he had saved his country, unquote. And I'm saying again, behind this willingness to repress popular forces, behind this willingness of modern day historians to accept this repression of popular forces is a chronic fear of the democratic excesses of the people. I'm not talking about Cicero. We can understand this guy was, this guy was you know, involved in the events of the day. He was a rich class elitist and that was that. I'm talking about Professor Scullard and other historians like him who live in this supposedly democratic age but who suffer from the fear of the people mobilizing and agitating without the restraints imposed by upper-class men of moderation and probity. Upper-class moderation and probity, my friends, exists more in the minds of gentlemen historians than it does in actual history. And these guys say nothing about who is to restrain those at the top with the power. The best known and probably greatest popularized leader was Julius Caesar. Although thanks to the way history is manufactured and retailed, very few of us know him in that role. Here are some of the things that Caesar did in his six or seven consulships and after the civil war against Pompey when he served as imperator, which has been misleadingly translated as dictator and more accurately should be called commander in chief or supreme commander. Once in power, Caesar founded new settlements for 80,000 proletarians. He distributed some of the choice lands to 20,000 poor families who had three or more children. Caesar sent many unemployed proletarians to repair ancient cities in the colonies or slated them for employment on public works in Rome. He ordered every large landholder to have at least one third of his workforce as free labor instead of slave labor. This would compel payment of wages, and it would diminish the landowner's obscenely high profits, and it would reduce unemployment and crime. As relief to poor tenants, Caesar canceled a whole year of rent obligations for low to moderate dwellings. We have some rent control board people here. I know they're feeling warm right now. 
He increased duties on luxury imports to encourage Italian domestic industry and also to make the rich pay something to the state for their lavish lifestyle. He capped tax rates in the provinces in order to rein in the rapacious tax collectors and give the people in the provinces some relief. He ejected from the Senate a number of those who were associated with provincial plunder and corruption. He allowed repayments of debts at lower pre-war prices. He ordered that the interest people had paid be applied to reducing the principal they owed. Oh, if we could only get some banks to go along with that. Huh? He canceled all debt interest that was due since the beginning of the Civil War. This last measure alone, Suetonius reckons, reduced the debt right there with one swipe of the pen, reduced the debt by one-fourth, which was a substantial loss to rich creditors. You know, there are two theories as to why people fall into debt. One of them says that many people are deprived of adequate income and are subjected to heartless taxes. Being unable to make enough money or keep enough of what they earn, they're forced to borrow on their future labor in the hope that things will get better. As their debt obligation accumulates and more of their income goes into interest payments, they have even less for their own needs and they have to force to borrow still more. And caught in this deepening cycle of debt, they're forced to sell their small holdings, their land eventually, and sometimes even themselves or their children into servitude. And by the way, Caesar abolished that. Humans could not be reduced to property and could not be sold into servitude because of debt. He laid the groundwork for modern bankruptcy laws. The debt cycle continues to this day, as you know. Whole nations are caught in the debt trap, selling off the land and labor of future generations to international investors at most unfavorable terms. The second theory of debt says that people incur debts because they're irresponsible spendthrifts who try to live off thrifty creditors. In this scenario, <laughs> well, well, wait a minute. In this scenario, the roles of victim and victimizer are reversed. The creditor is seen as the victim and the debtor is seen as the victimizer. And this model, though, I think does explain the behavior of some people. The only thing wrong is that it's applied to the wrong social group, to the poor. In fact, there are some profligate few, la jeunesse dorée, the gilded youth, who come from socially esteemed backgrounds, who live in a grand style, and they have, through history, cultivated the magic art of borrowing forever while paying back never. Such limitless credit, such big credit, though, is more likely to be extended not to the poor farmer or laborer, <clears throat> the poor farmer or laborer, but to those of gilded heritage. Caesar's efforts at easing the debt burden were designed to help not the profligate few, but the laboring masses. For Cicero, such reforms really were tantamount to subversion and revolution. And he was voicing the fears of many of his class when he said, quote, I foresee a bloodbath and onslaught on private property, the return of democratic exiles, and the cancellation of debts. Cicero believed that Caesar would show no mercy in, quote, killing off the nobility and plundering the well-to-do. In fact, Caesar showed remarkable clemency toward his enemies. He let a lot of them keep their estates. Uh, he forgave their uh, armed opposition to him and all that. And by the way, sparing the lives, in some instances, of people who later plotted and participated in the plot against his life. A number of historians argue that Caesar's intent was to attain autocratic power. And we even have the term Caesarism, which was very much in vogue in the 19th century, to mean dictatorial power. Actually, I believe that the crucial consideration is toward what end did Caesar use state power? Cui bono? Who benefited? Caesar himself declared, quote, I am sated with glory and power. It is more important for Rome that I live so that we might avoid another civil war. Now, how did Caesar hope to avoid another civil war? by curbing the power of the wealthy oligarchy and leaving something more for the people. By the way, his comment was prophetic. 
He didn't live, and Rome plunged into a series of protracted civil wars that ended with complete autocracy, Octavius taking power, who later changed his name to Caesar Augustus, the first Roman emperor, about whom I'll say a little more later. In Julius Caesar's own words, I quote him again, I want to protect myself against the slanders of my enemies, to restore to their rightful position the tribunes of the people who have been expelled because of their involvement in my cause, and to reclaim for myself and for the Roman people independence from the domination of a small clique. Caesar's treatment of Athens suggests that had he lived, he might have eventually taken steps to democratize the Roman constitution. After the Civil War, he introduced a democratic constitution for Athens. This is a city that for a century under Roman domination it had this aristocratic rule, the Athenian aristocrats as a comprador class in collaboration with the Roman aristocrats. He brought back democracy to Athens. He enfranchised the population in parts of Gaul he had conquered. That's a democratic move. Early in his career, he helped undo Sulla's reactionary legislation. Sulla, now this is a guy you should know about because he's, he's that, that, their answer to Pinochet and Suharto and a few other murderers. Sulla was a general who brought an army into Rome, and from 82 to 80 BC, he murdered 1,500 equestrians, 50 senators, and thousands of commoners who had shown sympathy for the democratic cause. He stripped the people's tribunes of their ancient authority to block certain acts by the Senate. Caesar reinstated tribunal authority, another move toward democracy. Caesar began regularly to bypass the Senate and deal only with the assembly. During his first consulship, he regularly disregarded senatorial vetoes. During his dictatorship, he divested the senatorial oligarchy of its executive powers and its control over the treasury and over government appointees. That's moving in a democratic direction. But that's what the elitist historians from Cicero to this day have seen as autocracy, as a violation of the Roman constitution. It's really a violation of the Senate's prerogatives. Caesar updated and streamlined the voter registration rolls. He granted citizenship to all medical practitioners and professors of liberal arts to encourage them to stay in Rome. He set about to provide Rome with high quality public libraries. He guaranteed to Jews the right to practice their strange religion, strange to the Romans because it was monotheistic. He was probably one of the very first leaders of antiquity to guarantee religious freedom. He was the first I could find, but you say one of the first because you never know someone's going to come up in the question period and say, what about Herodotus who pointed out this guy who, you know. So you cover yourself, you say one of the first. <laughs> Caesar had the proceedings of the Senate and the Assembly published daily. He had them posted all around Rome, making them more accountable to the general public. It was also a way to embarrass the senators when he could. He decisively terminated Cicero's political witch hunts against the Democrats and drove Cicero into exile. He substantially expanded Senate membership to include lesser nobles and nobility from Gaul, and even made senators of a small number of libertini, the Libertini were the sons of slaves, the sons of liberated slaves who had risen to distinction on their own merit. All of these appointments, of course, were openly snubbed by the Senate optimates. I mean, they wouldn't even look at these people. The governing posts, many of them, when considerations permitted, were filled by Caesar's slaves, freedmen, or followers of humble birth. Now, some of the Democrats in Rome really sought a total social revolution, a redistribution of wealth among the poor. Some even thought to free the slaves and extend citizenship to foreign residents. Caesar found their support useful, but he was not a social revolutionary. He was a reformer. He abolished all the worker guilds, something I have never forgiven him for, except the ancient ones, and would not go all the way with the Democrats by eliminating all death payments debt payments. And he accrued extraordinary honors and power to himself. He appointed himself not imperator for six months, but for life. 
Caesar was assassinated as he presided over the Senate on March 15, 44 BC, the Ides of March, by a dozen or so senators led by Cassius and Brutus. There are very vivid accounts in Appian, in Plutarch, and Suetonius. Caesar was very aware that there were these constant plots against his life. He would never move against the plotters. He would just announce his awareness of it, and they would all shrink back. Uh, and the story goes, as he, well, he dismissed his contingent of Spanish guard. He didn't bring them into the Senate with him. The Spanish guard was made up of crack warriors, and they could have taken out the whole Senate, let alone a dozen uh, assassins. But he went in on his own alone. I think it was because he did not want to show that he had any fear of any plot. And I think he'd never imagined they would try to kill him right in the Senate house itself. And supposedly someone came up and handed him a note, which he put in with the sheaves of paper he had, which told him of what was imminent right there, because he had his own undercover people around. And he put the sheet of paper in with his other notes, walked in, and the first senator who approached him to propose a bill took out the dagger, and they all came at him and thrust at him. He gathered up his toga in a protective gesture, staggered, swung back, tried to, and then fell dead at the base of the statue of Pompeii. A story which just sounds too poignant, too significant to strike me as being true, but it's a great story anyway. <laughs> the historians who are willing to consider any interest except class interest explain away the assassination in terms that are really rather favorable to the assassins. So we're told that the conspirators had a strong distaste for one-man dictatorship. They wanted to preserve their beloved republic. They wanted to preserve the laws and traditions. Others supposedly felt a personal jealousy and rivalry because they were so overshadowed by this truly remarkable man. And to be sure, Julius Caesar was a, a man of outstanding qualities. He was said to have been a commanding and inspiring figure, uncommonly intelligent, handsome, and utterly charming when he cared to be. He never overindulged in alcohol, unlike many members of his class. His enemy, Cato, once remarked that Caesar was the only sober man who ever tried to wreck the Constitution. <laughs> he wasn't given to luxurious living, like most members of his class, although he was something of a dandy in his personal attire. <clears throat> he was the son of one of Rome's leading aristocratic families, he was a brilliant military leader who inspired his troops. He was highly regarded for the quality and clarity of his writing and was considered one of the great prose stylists of his day. His intellectual interests were remarkably wide-ranging and deep. He was considered one of Rome's greatest public speakers. He could stir his audience with the force and persuasive clarity of his words while avoiding the purple oratory style, which was the style of that day. Caesar also possessed some less than perfect traits. Like other military commanders of his day, he was a conqueror and plunder of lands. Although, you know, his army had a high percentage of young men from northern Italian towns who had really become fired up by this idea of civic freedom and spreading that idea, almost like the French Revolutionary Army after the French Revolution, spreading that message to other places. So it wasn't an army built purely on pillage and plunder. There were some ideas there. Caesar extorted huge sums from rich monarchs. I actually cannot get too upset about that one. <laughs> Caesar was notorious for sleeping with a vast number of women, both married and unmarried, both commoners and members of the highest nobility, including four queens. Who's counting? Four queens. <laughs> the most famous, you all know, uh, Cleopatra, who bore him a son. He also, in his youth, did a king or two for which he was subjected to homophobic baiting by Cicero and others years later. I'm not going to say anything more about Caesar's sex life. I think in recent times we've heard enough about the sex life of uh, one White House occupant to last us to the end of this century, this empire, certainly, in this century. If Caesar's power upset the Senate, and he did accumulate power, it was because of how he used it. He attempted to deal with unemployment. He attempted to deal with poverty, 
with unfair taxes, with land redistribution, with debt relief, and with aristocratic greed. I mean, when you tamper with the moneyed privileges of the ruling class, that is what's unforgivable. That's what they hated about him. If the aristocrats long to protect the Constitution, which, by the way, was an unwritten one based on custom and practice, it was not out of some abstract commitment to Republican principles. It was because the Constitution fortified their oligarchy. It was their law, their Constitution, their republic made to accommodate their class interests. Aristocratic freedom is meant to serve no constituency except the aristocrats themselves. Aristocratic freedom, the freedom of class elites, was and still is to this day antithetical to popular democracy as it continues to demonstrate as much as pursued by corporate elites with their NAFTA and GATT and MAI and their lobbyists and everything else they do here and abroad. The aristocracy of international global finance ever devising means to making themselves unaccountable to democratic power. <laughs> Julius Caesar was the last in a line of populares. Now we're going to go backwards just to confuse you a little more. I want to talk about some of the others that came before him. And maybe the first was the great Tiberius Gracchus in 133 BC, followed by his younger brother in 121, the brilliant leader Gaius Gracchus, and some 10 or 12 others. Almost all of these popularis leaders for that century, 133 to 44, almost all of them were assassinated, murdered by aristocratic death squads, along with thousands of their followers. Other such leaders met sudden and untimely deaths, sometimes under suspicious circumstances. What all these popular leaders had in common is that they challenged the rigged oligarchic system that was designed to thwart democratic action. I mean, even if they broke no laws, they were criticized by the gentlemen historians of that day and this day as provocateurs, ill-judged, short-sighted transgressors, etc. These are quotes. According to some historians, these popular leaders had to share the blame for their own deaths because they acted in such a supposedly rash and provocative manner. I mean, what could the Senate do? You provoke us, we have to kill you. <laughs> Especially the Gracchi. I mean, they really started all this popularis stuff. This business, by the way, of blaming the reformers themselves for the homicidal violence that's delivered upon them by conservative forces is a time-honored practice. It exists today. I'm reminded of 1973, President Salvador Allende of Chile attempting egalitarian reforms in the face of an entrenched military and corporate power only to be murdered with thousands of his supporters. Shortly after Pinochet's military coup in Chile, the New York Times editorialized, quote, a heavy share for the blame for this disaster must be assigned to the unfortunate Dr. Allende himself for pushing a socialist program for which he had no mandate. That's not true. The second popular front election, his percent, the popular front the percentages went up. His mandate was growing. That's why they had to have the coup. But assuming he didn't have a mandate, does that become grounds for giving him a heavy share of the blame for his own murder? <laughs> the last to be blamed by the US press for the mass killings in Chile were the killers themselves, the Chilean military, financed, advised, equipped by the US national security state. Getting, <clears throat> and dealing with Rome, the same thing. They don't blame the killers. They don't blame the real assassins. Listen to Scullard's, Professor Scullard's polemical gymnastics. <laughs> Quote, I work hard to dig up these quotes, and I want you to listen. <laughs> Quote, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the prudent, quote, scholar, the prudent senators were forced to confront the overzealous reformer, 
It's talking about Tiberius Gracchus in 133. The urban mob that thronged the assembly in Rome was becoming increasingly irresponsible. Tiberius was threatening to turn the tribunes into agents of the popular will. <laughs> this would have given the assembly greater responsibility than it could properly wield. <laughs> so, of course, they had to kill him. Like every ruling oligarchy in history, the Roman Senate had a long tradition of violating its own traditions when necessity dictated. And this brings us to Parenti's second law of politics. <laughs> Don't ask me what the first law, I think it just sounds better, the second law <laughs> of politics. <laughs> when change threatens to rule, then the rules are changed. <laughs> <clears throat> Faced with challenges from democratic forces, the oligarchs repeatedly invoked martial law for about over a three-century period of the Republic, suspending all constitutional rights, appointing dictators of their own choice. In Appian's phrase, they found salvation in absolute power. And this they did again and again. All the emperors who came after Caesar wielded substantially more power than he, yet the senators went along with them. They didn't complain about their republican traditions, their liberties, because the emperors destroyed whatever power the popular assemblies had had. The emperors initiated regressive taxes and attempted no economic redistribution on behalf of the masses. The senate was reduced to a kind of house of lords, where you could dawdle and twaddle and sit about and maybe feel important and prestigious and debate things. But under the emperors, they had a lot of, in other words, they had a lot of prestige, but very little power. But under the emperors, the senatorial class grew still wealthier, and the Senate had no problem accepting these powerful tyrants. In short, when their class interests are at stake, the senators, like elites today, have no trouble choosing political dictatorship over the palest traces of economic democracy. When push came to shove, their fortunes meant more to them than even their power, as long as they knew that state power was in the hands of someone who protected their fortunes. The description Aurelius Victor gives, which came several centuries after Caesar, but it can be applied, it, it describes the late Republic too. The senators gloried in idleness and at the same time trembled for their wealth, the use and the increase of which they accounted greater than eternal life itself, unquote. I think that's pretty good for, um, for the fourth century AD. Those who think that politics and history are all just all about power might want to reflect on this. I don't think it's just all about power. People just want power. I mean, to be sure, there are ambitious individuals who pursue power as an end in itself, a way to advance their unprincipled careers, to heap glory on themselves. But the owning class as a class is more interested in maintaining its extraordinary privileges to live sumptuously off the labor of others, to plunder public treasuries and to preserve and expand its wealth. And if that means supporting an autocrat, then so be it. Throughout history, these popular leaders, wherever they arise, have been accused of being demagogues, not wanting the power to end hunger, but merely hungering for power, seeking mass support in order to advance their own fortunes. This accusation is still leveled today against communists and other revolutionaries and reformers, even by some illustrious people who inhabit the left. Now, what did concern the popularis? Listen to Tiberius Gracchus, the demagogue, the self-enhancing. Tiberius Gracchus came from a, a leading family. He already, he wasn't a patrician, he was a plebeian, but he had plenty of, he was one of the leading families of Rome wasn't looking to advance himself particularly. This is what he had to say, describing the plight of landless commoners, his supporters, when he was trying to fight and push through this land redistribution bill in 133. 
Many of these supporters, by the way, were army veterans. Quote, Hearthless and homeless, they must take their wives and families and tramp the roads like beggars. They fight and fall to serve no other end but to multiply the possessions and comforts of the rich. Unquote. Did the Gracchi and the other populares leaders use power to advance themselves or to advance the well-being of their people? I would say it's not an either-or formulation. My view is that popular leaders want the opportunity to pursue policies that benefit the common people. They also want to win mass support and mobilize popular power because you need that. I mean, how do you mobilize powerless people against a powerfully entrenched system? And you've got to get your own policies and operations. So they're not, of course, they're not indifferent to power. And they might also though, enjoy the personal gratification and glory that comes from a kind of risky but popular undertaking like that. Look at the survival rate. On. <laughs> very few leaders, are, by the way, are completely indifferent to popularity, and very few are completely motivated exclusively by its pursuit. Rather than speculating about a leader's motives and personality, it's more useful to ask what social forces gave him his momentum. And in Rome, one of the major forces was the much maligned proletariat. If we're to believe present-day bourgeois historians, the proletariat played no democratic role in ancient Rome. In fact, their efforts helped to bring these leaders forward, leaders who challenged senatorial misrule. In 82 BC, they actually resisted the reactionary dictator Sulla. Sulla brought his army into Rome. Now, there was an ancient code an ancient rule that no Roman general could ever bring regular troops into Rome, whole contingents, that is. I mean, you, of course, have a guard, whatever. And Sulla disrupted that. And there's a great description, I think it's in, I forget, Plutarch or Suetonius, of the Roman people standing in the mass and heaving rocks and everything else they get their hands on at the Roman legions and actually stopping the legions putting on such a barrage that the legions were stopped and stunned for a while anyway. The proletariat knew that Sulla was their enemy. In 50 BC, they gave enthusiastic support to Caesar when he crossed the Rubicon with his legions and returned to Rome from Gaul. In 48, they engaged in mass agitation when oligarchic magistrates tried to obstruct the implementation of Caesar's debt relief law. After the civil war between Pompey and Caesar, the city crowds pulled down and they smashed statues that were out in the public, statues of Pompey and Sulla. Now, after the civil war, that's almost 40 years after Sulla, but the people had a historic memory and a very strong feeling still about that thing. Plutarch offers a glimpse into the mass support that propelled the Gracchi brothers. See, I've got to give you these just these scrap instances of this happening because we have almost no record of the popular forces and people and what they did or didn't do. So we just have to look at these incidents and from this we make certain deductions. That's the hazards of, of ancient history. Plutarch, he gives a very interesting glimpse of the mass support that propelled the Gracchi brothers, which by the way, all modern historians seem to have ignored with a few, one or two exceptions. W-E-O-S Geneva, W-X-X-E Fenner, Syracuse. Plutarch writes, It was above all the people themselves who did most to arouse Tiberius's energy and ambitions by inscribing slogans and appeals on porticos, monuments, and the walls of houses, calling upon him to recover the public land for the poor, the aga publica. In other words, they covered Rome with political graffiti. And when Gaius Gracchus put forth his reform legislation, which, by the way, was much more comprehensive and groundbreaking than anything Tiberius had, and which really gave Caesar a lot of the ideas that he pursued, Plutarch writes, a great multitude began to gather in Rome from all parts of Italy to support him, unquote. After the Gracchi were assassinated in 133 and 121, respectively, Public acknowledgement of their existence was officially prohibited by the oligarchs. Isn't that interesting? 
Even then, they sought to control historical memory. And yet, the common people continued to commemorate the Gracchi. Plutarch offers the following vignette. The people were cowed and humiliated by the collapse of the democratic cause, but they soon showed how deeply they missed and longed for the Gracchi. Statues of the brothers were set up in a prominent part of the city. Offerings were placed there throughout the year. Many people worshipped their statues as though they were visiting the shrines of gods." Unquote. In 44, immediately after Caesar's death, popular agitation was strong enough to compel Brutus to grudgingly, I mean very grudgingly, reassure them that the Senate would not tamper, would not at all tamper with the land redistribution, which turned out to be eventually a lie. Brutus was dubbed by William Shakespeare, as you know, in his play, Julius Caesar, Act V, the noblest Roman of them all. The noble Brutus supposedly acted only from principled motives. When you put him up against Cicero, he does look pretty good, I'll admit. <laughs> but, he, uh, but he was, you know, a key conspirator, along with Cassius, in the assassination of a great leader, a leader who happened to love him. Brutus's mother and Caesar had been lovers, by the way. The noble Brutus was also a usurer of the worst sort, having lent money to Cypriots at 48% interest <laughs> instead of the usual 12%, which was usurious enough. 48% interest. Oh, the nobility. They're so noble. They have too much. <laughs> and then he requested the Roman military to go into Cyprus and help his agents collect the debt. But most historians don't think ill of Brutus. They see him as principled. Another conservative senator, an arch-conservative, who is much admired as a principled opponent of Caesar, was Cato, by the way, after whom the right-wing think tank, the Cato Institute, is named. I'm, I'm not kidding. It's true. <laughs> Good. The reason they named their institute after Cato was because he supposedly was a defender of republican principles and he unswervingly opposed Caesar's tyranny. But the principled Cato could indulge in plots to kill people, bribe people, enlist them in violent acts, plunder the provinces. You know, when left leaders are uncompromisingly dedicated to their class struggle, and use organized power against reactionary assaults. They're labeled dogmatic, rigid, totalitarian, power-hungry, even Stalinist, a nutty term that is often left conveniently undefined. When uncompromising conservatives like Cato rigidly adhere to their class interests, they're called principled. You know, some time ago, I was reminded of Cato. I was... Um, I was... Um, after a long, day work, I like, a long day of work, I like to relax sometimes by reading fiction. So I picked up a copy of the New York Times. <laughs> and there was an article on Congressman Sonny Bono. Now, Congressman Sonny Bono had voted against almost every environmental law in the books. He voted for clear-cutting, for wiping out forests, you know. And the article was about the fact that Sonny Bono was skiing and he ran, he encountered a, <laughs> he encountered, <laughs> he encountered a tree that stood its ground, you know. <laughs> we, and we, we here in Berkeley call that fight back. <laughs> The tree really got the better of Sonny Bono. He, he died. This, I realized, oh my gosh, this is an obituary. <laughs> and the obituary describes the late Congressman Bono as a stalwart conservative with a solidly conservative approach. The Washington Post describes him as loyal to his conservative principles. Now, is that positive framing or what? When do we hear of someone being called solidly radical or solidly Marxist or a highly principled communist? You know? <laughs> 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 
Historians who say that we must immerse ourselves in the particular era under study and we must perceive it purely through the eyes of its participants, that sounds so great, but it's totally impossible, they forget that this usually means seeing the era through the eyes of its dominant class. In this instance, the Roman aristocracy. I mean, you know, 90% of the primary sources we have on the late Republic come from Cicero. Now, I mean, it's a skewered record. And how far do you apply that rule of what I call contextual immersion? Do you apply it to Nazi Germany? Well, anti-Semitism was a part of the Nazi political culture. Uh, that's the way they experience and perceive things. In any case, the rule of contextual immersion is regularly violated by most historians when it suits their own ideological proclivities. They don't see things through the eyes of the participants when casting their own disdainful eye on the common people, as I think I've been trying to demonstrate through this whole lecture. Those who act so unattractively, outrageously, provocatively by struggling for weird things like subsidized bread prices, land reform, public jobs, and rent control. The gentlemen historians don't ever bother to say, let's see what agitated these people. Did anything relate to their human needs? Their sense of justice? Was it really all just a manifestation of irrational, low-life agitation? Wasn't there something about this constitution and its liberties that were horribly limited and hypocritical? Instead, the common people are looked down upon. Cicero repeatedly described the urban poor as the, quote, city dirt and filth, the urban scum, unruly and inferior, a starving, contemptible rabble. Now note, he admits they're starving, but he sees that as their fault, their deficiency. And whenever the people agitated against class injustice, then they became something even worse in Cicero's mind, something even more dangerous, more loathsome. They became the mob. Appian, Appian writing a century after Cicero, describes Caesar as, quote, introducing laws to win the favor of the mob, whom he describes as the poor and hot-headed. In our own day, P.A. Brunt, refers to the city mob. For Lily Ross Taylor, it's the city rabble. For Cyril Robinson, it's the, the stupid Roman mob, a selfish, good-for-nothing, parasitic mob. Don't hold back, Cyril. <laughs> <laughs> for Scullard, it's the idle urban mob, as if their idleness were of their own choice. And if they were so idle, who did all the work? It wasn't all slave labor. In fact, in the urban areas, it was not mostly not slave labor. Meanwhile, the aristocratic idlers, the real parasites who live in obscene opulence, they earn not a harsh word from the great majority of these writers. Another classic historian, a modern day, John Dickinson charges that Caesar appealed to the cupidity of those who desired to be supported by the state. Dickinson repeatedly writes of Clodius and his mob. Clodius, by the way, was a populares ally of Caesar who sought to legalize the political ward clubs. He was an aristocrat, one of the populares. He organized neighborhoods and guilds to political action. He armed neighborhood cadres to defend themselves against the ruling class toughs. He outlawed executions without trial, a direct jab at Cicero for the executions without trial that he perpetrated during the Catiline conspiracy. Clodius also extended the grain dole. All of this is judged by Professor Dickinson as attempts to, quote, tighten the control of the mob over political life. Other historians describe Clodius as a demagogue and an adventurer. He and a large number of his followers were murdered by a ruling class death squad operative named Milo and his band of paid gladiators. Later brought to trial, Milo was defended by Cicero. Incidentally, Milo's thugs are never described as a mob, even though they acted like mobsters. So outraged by Clodius's murder, the Roman plebs, the proletariat called the plebs, they brought his body into the Senate house put it down, put a pile of chairs, and started a funeral pyre and burned down the Senate House. 
<clears throat> During the early empire, the Roman poet Juvenel wrote scornfully of the mob's preoccupation with bread and circuses, a phrase that has echoed down to us over the centuries, adding to the image of Rome's proletariat as a shiftless, volatile mass addicted to endless handouts of free food and free entertainment. Elite historians have ever been alert to the corrupting influence that state assistance supposedly inflicts on the poor. Appian tells us that the corn ration attracted the idly destitute and hot-headed elements of the Italian population to the capital, whom he contrasts with those, quote, those who possessed property and good sense. Almost 1,900 years later, Scullard writes that Clodius's law to change the corn subsidy into a completely free dole, quote, hastened the demoralization of the people. When the reactionary Sulla, 40 years before, abolished the corn distribution, this was called a reform by our gentlemen historians, and no critical comment on the immense hardship it might have inflicted on the urban poor. This image of an idle mob of layabouts sponging off the state is little more than a figment of upper class and middle class imagination, both ancient and modern alike. It's interesting that so many of those who've written about Rome find it so disreputable that the humble Romans should have been concerned about having enough food for themselves and their children. Oh, they wanted bread, imagine that. This hardly makes them materialistic or degraded. By the way, in any event, only a very limited number in Rome received the regular corn dole. And furthermore, man cannot live by bread alone, even at the physiological and material level. The proletarians need money for food, clothing, cooking fuel, other necessities. Most of them had a fine work, low-paying and irregular as it might be. The bread dole often was a necessary supplement. It often was the difference between survival and starvation, but it was not a source of total support that allowed them to idle away their days. This raises another question. Who exactly was the mob? The same question comes up in regard to the French Revolution. You read Stanley Loomis's book on the French Revolution, 400 pages. I started becoming aware of it through it. I began really. 400 pages. He never once talks about the people, the citizenry, the popular crowds. It was always the Parisian mob, the Parisian rabble, the mob, the mob, the mob. Well, who made up the mob? The answer given for both Rome of 44 BC and Paris of 1798 AD is the same, or 1789 AD is the same. They were lumpens, drifters, riffraff. In fact, closer study reveals that in both Rome and Paris, the so-called mob consisted of artisans, craftsmen, shopkeepers, day laborers, masons, teamsters, dock workers, respectable, hard-working proletarians. And the circuses. What about the circuses? Who went to the arena? Many writers seem to forget that the urban poor were not the ones who created and financed the awful spectacles of the amphitheater, nor were they the only ones to attend. Probably a higher percentage of nobles and equestrians attended, seating in that lowest first tier where they can get the best view of the slaughter of humans and animals. The common people of ancient Rome, like the common people of so many societies, had scant opportunity to leave a written record of their grievances and aspirations. What little we know of them suggests that the proletariat could sometimes display a social consciousness superior to anything possessed by their would-be superiors. Many of them worked next to slaves and were themselves freedmen or sons of freedmen, being almost as poor as slaves. In 63, during Cicero's